Um, let me start by saying, first of all, a thank you to Fiona. Fiona stepped in for me last week. Um, I was supposed to be preaching last week, um, but um, unfortunately I caught this bug, whatever it is, that gives you a horrible throat and a nasty cough. Um, and for me, that attacked my voice. So last week I had a very quiet voice, and even today it's nowhere near as loud as normal, which is why we've got the microphone up, all the speakers up quite high. Um, so, so yeah, thank you, Fiona, and I'm sorry I missed last week. Um, I'll do my best this week. Um, if I do start coughing, I will simply cough into my arm for a little while, and then we'll get back on with the sermon. But let's see where we can go. So, we are talking now about putting on Christ. This is a sermon where what we're saying, a series where we're talking about the fact that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, Jesus shared with us in more depth how to live. Now, when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was relatively early in his ministry. He had some disciples and he was calling them together and he was talking to them about life as a Christian, although they didn't know the name, the term then, about life following him. People at that time were used to the idea of following teachers. A teacher would come up, they would talk about the scripture, and they would explain it in their, their own way, and people would become disciples of those people and would follow them and try and imitate them. For the, the Jews at the time, many of them just assumed that Jesus was another new teacher. Although he was different because not only did he say things, but he did things as well. He spoke as one with authority, is the way the Bible puts it. He did miraculous things. So Jesus then comes to a point where he calls his disciples together, he sits them down... And he starts talking to them. Now, before we even hear what he said, let's just remind ourselves from Jesus' own words, why? Why did he do this? Why did he sit them down? What was he trying to do? And there's two very short passages, two very short bits. One in Matthew 4 and verse 17. And he says this. Or it says this, from this time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus was purpose in talking to people was to talk about the kingdom of heaven and to call people to change their lives, to turn their lives around, to now live a way, a different way, the kingdom of heaven way. In Matthew 5 and verse 20. It says this. And Jesus said this to the disciples right at the beginning. So after the Beatitudes. Before he went in to talking about uh, the Sermon on the Mount. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that was an amazing statement for him to make. Because the Jews, the people he was talking to, all believed that the way into heaven was to do what the law said. The people they looked up to as being examples of doing this were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. These were the people that everybody held up as being the ones who knew what they were doing, that in a sense they're guaranteed to go in. We're the minions and we're desperately trying to play catch up. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, what they're saying, to be frank, is not good enough. So, bearing that in mind then, if following the law is not good enough to get you into heaven, 
if following the great teachers is not good enough to get you into heaven, what is Jesus asking of us? Now, can I just compare it with that video? So there we have a video where the bankers are saying, you know, we need to demonstrate our integrity. Did you notice it didn't say we need to demonstrate our integrity because it is right. They said we need to demonstrate our integrity to earn people's trust. Which in one sense could say, so we can con them because we're not trustworthy, but we want them to believe that we are trustworthy. So we'll try and take a test which proves I've got integrity, which is a farce in itself. Now, what we're about to read, you will understand how that fits in. So let's read, let's read um, what Jesus said. It's a very, again, it's only a short passage. So this is from Matthew chapter 5 and starting at verse 31. And let me say right at the beginning, some of this stuff is really quite punchy if you take it to heart. Jesus is not saying stuff that you can just go, ooh, that's nice. So, verse 31. It has been said. He started that way, by the way, because that's exactly what the teachers did. I say to you, this is what the scripture says and this is what it means. So the teachers of the law went around going, I say to you, or if somebody didn't feel they were at that standard, this teacher said, this teacher says. So all the time, people are being told how to interpret the Bible. So Jesus says, it has been said. Anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So... Just while I'm letting you let that sink in for a minute, let's just pray. So, Father, we'd now just ask that you'd open this up. Jesus, you gave this passage to us. You want us to understand what you're saying. So, Holy Spirit, please take these words now and help us to understand what Jesus was telling us. You let us know and help us to be open. Give us ears to hear. So we give ourselves to you. Now, let's start by saying what he's not saying. So, believe it or believe it not, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no, is one of Anna's favourite sayings to me. Okay? And that's because when we're talking, she might be talking to me at a distance, and she'll ask me a question, and I will respond. And I will go, yes, no. Nope. And she'll go, do you mean yes or no? Was that a nope, or was it a yep? What, what exactly were you saying? And so I would go and... I said no, or I said yes. And she'd go, no, no, you didn't. It wasn't very clear. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now, we're not talking about accents and we're not talking about um, phrases from where you were brought up so that in Manchester, I might say yep and nope, right? In Wokingham, they obviously say yes and no. <laughs> okay, we're not talking about that. We're talking about something a bit deeper. So, let me ask you a question and let me give you um, an admission. I break promises. I say things that at the moment I say it, I might genuinely intend. But something happens 
or remember something. Or I go home and say to Anna, I've agreed this, and she goes, well, what about? At work, sometimes people put things into my diary. Sometimes I say it without checking my diary. And I agree to do things, and I don't do them. Because I've agreed to do something else at exactly that same moment in time. So I can't do two things simultaneously. And there are actually times when I say something, and what I'm trying to do is get out of something. So somebody says something to me, and I'll agree, where actually there are times when I think, well, I don't really want to do that. But rather than say, no, I fudge it. Now, I'm not proud of that, but let's be honest. And I think if we're all being honest in this room, there are similar things that we do. And I tell you, politicians do it all the time. Jesus is coming to us now and challenging us on our mouths and what we say. And I think if we're all, again, being frank and honest, we wish what came out of our mouths was better at times. Sometimes what we say is hurtful. Sometimes it's evasive. Sometimes it's a downright lie. And even with best intentions, some of the things you say later on proved to be not so good. So Jesus wants us to talk about this very important matter. What comes out of our mouths? So let's start with the second topic rather than the first. So out of the two, the second one is oaths. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, and we'll come back to divorce because divorce is slightly more complex. So oaths then, what is an oath? An oath is when I effectively give a promise. I say I'm going to do something. Now, I don't know about you, but most of the time when I meet somebody for the first time, if I go to them and say, blah, 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 and we agree something, I just assume that they will do it. However, if that person doesn't do it, then with the best will in the world, mentally you just go, hmm, they didn't do that. If they don't do something else a second time, or they don't do something else a third time, then gradually what happens is your confidence in them actually carrying out what they say um, reduces. So the person on there who, who is talking to you might then realise that they've lost your trust, just as a certain banker might feel that they, they've lost our trust. And so what they do is they start to make promises and back it up with something else that they imagine will somehow convince us that this means they will do what they were going to do when before they haven't. So they promise and the children do it. That's the classic one. Bringing up kids, you know this straight away, don't you? you know, they've not done their homework this time. And you say, you've got to do your homework now. And they say they don't want to do it now. But they promise they'll do it once this programme's finished. They promise they'll do it after such and such. If they could just do this, they guarantee that that will happen. And of course, in reality, they might mean it for a second at that moment in time. But in reality, they don't really mean it. And so, in this case, and in the common parlance of the day, people will go... I promise that on the temple. Some people nowadays might go, I promise it on the life of my children. Well, that's a lovely thing to say, isn't it? But anyway. Um, but yeah, they'll try and come up with some ridiculous statement that seems to prove beyond a shadow of doubt they'll definitely do it. Well, what Jesus is saying here is, every promise you make, make sure that you, you consider before you make it. It's better to say, let me think about that. I'll come back to you. I don't know if I can. Than it is to promise something and then not deliver it. Because it affects how people relate to you and trust you. And he's, he's asking us to let our yes be yes. So if you say yes, you mean yes. And you don't need to say anything else. Now... For something to mean yes, it can't just come out of your mouth. 
it's got to be in here as well, hasn't it? And it's got to be in here as well. So if you say yes, this, this, and this must all be in harmony. Otherwise, there's a real danger that you'll say yes and do no. And that's what Jesus is challenges. Do you remember last week what Fiona was talking, one of the phrases that Fiona repeated? She repeated about, look at the root, not at the fruit. The fruit is, I say yes and then don't do it. The root is, I've got the wrong heart attitude. And Jesus is challenging them, saying, what is your heart attitude? Now, it's challenging in a culture if the culture says you have to be polite and you can't, by saying no, it's impolite. In England, we don't have that culture. You can say no. And it's right and proper. There are times to say no. You don't have to say yes all the time. Jesus doesn't say here you have to say yes all the time. He's just saying think about it. Before you make a comment, think about it. So if you promise to do something, do it. I don't think there's anybody who would find that contentious. Do what's in your heart. Do it. Say what's in your heart. Don't pretend. Don't hide. Don't say something just because you feel you should. Or you don't want to offend. Say what you mean. Mean what you say. Easy to say. Not always easy to do. Let's talk about the second one then. Let's talk about divorce. Now, divorce is, a, is talking about, obviously, marriage initially. Now, marriage is relationship. This is me with Anna, the person that we feel should be the most important person in our life. If you marry somebody on a whim, you are a fool. If you marry somebody because at this moment in time, it feels like a good idea. Marriage is vital. It is the core of the family that we have. It is, it is there to build our society on. It is how our children know what is good and bad and how our children know and get pointed towards Jesus. Marriage is, is, is a bedrock. If you're not married, you can still do all those things. And I'm not saying that everybody has to get married. In fact, Paul made it clear he felt at times it was better not to get married. So, but it is, as a cornerstone of our society, marriage is important. But don't go into it lightly. Now, if you make that promise, and later... We start talk, we're talking about divorce. Now that is a serious matter and Jesus wanted to raise it and challenge it. So, in here, the passage we've got is incredibly brief and it could be misinterpreted. But Jesus actually expanded on this. He expanded on it in Matthew 19. And by reading Matthew 19, we get far more of an understanding of what Jesus was talking about. So let's just briefly cover that. Matthew 19, starting at verse 3. Some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him, and they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning, of the, the, beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So there are no, they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Why then, the Pharisees asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, and marries another woman, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, 
if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. What is Jesus saying? Let's talk about the society for a minute. You may or may not be aware, but in Jewish society, a man could divorce his wife, a wife could not divorce her husband. Now she could, but only with the husband's agreement. So the husband had to actually ratify it. What were the grounds for divorce at this time? I don't like your cooking. I don't like the way you tidy the house. I don't like the fact that you have got a better job than me, if such a thing happened. They could divorce, the husband could divorce their wife for anything. The wife had no power. And men would do this on a whim. They would break the ultimate promise to another individual, I will live with you forever, until I die, on the basis that they put too much salt in their dinner. How wrong is that? Jesus had to step into this situation. He had to get involved. He had to say what God's heart was. That was never, ever God's intention. Divorce is terrible. Divorce hurts the couple, both parties in it, in our modern society. It hurts the family around the children. It is not something to be taken lightly. And I'm not saying here that if somebody's being abused in a marriage relationship, they have to stay there and just continue to be abused. But it is not something you do on a whim. And it is not something you do lightly. And what Jesus was saying, your heart attitude when you go into a marriage should be one of the highest standard. When you make a promise, it is a challenge because sometimes... Later on, it becomes a bit difficult. What Jesus is saying here is, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. What it means, Anna, when you're in a marriage relationship that's going sour, when it's a challenge, you can either go, the promise doesn't count, I'm moving out of this because it's just too difficult. Or you can start praying, Lord, what do I do next? Paul wrote in Romans, how do you know that you will not save your husband? Or how do you know, why, uh, husband, that you will not save your wife? How do you know how this situation is going to end? Now, it doesn't mean, it does not mean that divorce can never happen. But it does say, do everything you possibly can to avoid it, because we treat our promises seriously. Paul actually says, if, if a person, if the other person goes and they're not a believer, you cannot force them to stay. But as far as it lies with you, do everything you can. Sometimes, even that might not be enough. But do everything you can. Sometimes those decisions lead to consequences. But do you know what? Jesus knows exactly all about consequences. Because Jesus... And the father made a promise right at the start. When we fell, God, right at the beginning, look at the early chapters of um, Genesis, said he would come up with a solution. He made a decision then that he would sort this out. And the cost for his promise was that his son would die on a cross. Not for his own sins, but for our sins. You and I are here and we can be Christians because Jesus died for us. And every marriage that's going wrong, Jesus died for. 
every child that's affected by a negative relationship, Jesus died for. Every piece of hurt, every pain, Jesus died for. And he can help and he can come in and he can heal and he can do the miraculous and he can change things. He can support you as you go through incredible ordeals. And he can make it different. Jesus knows about consequences because he took the consequences. Your consequences, my consequences. He took them himself. So when we're talking about this, when Jesus talks about this, and he says, when you make a promise, stick to it. He did. All the way. Right up to a cross. Right up to the nails. All the way through. Into death. Through death. And out the other side into resurrection. He knew what it was to deal with consequences. So. Hard? Not easy, but with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, it is possible. And we have, we have people in our church. We have people in our church who have thought about um, divorce at times, thought about leaving partners, who have prayed, who have worked, who have sacrificed, and who have come through. We've got people in our church who have prayed, who have worked, who have sacrificed and their marriages still fail. But Jesus can help you through. Don't break your promise. It's not easy, but you don't have to. So Father, I come to you now because in myself, I cannot do what I've just asked us all to do. So, Lord, what we're asking for is your help. Holy Spirit, we're asking for you because we cannot do this in our own strength. We can will it, but at times we can't carry it through. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to keep our word. And we consider and be thoughtful in that. And in the highest priority, in marriage and in partnerships and relationships, and whether it's in a business or whatever, when we commit to something... May we see it through. But Lord, as we finish, I ask for one thing, and I pray this now over this whole congregation, our whole church, Lord, for the people who are not here as well as those who are. Uh, for every hurt, for every piece of damage that's been done, for every sin that's been committed against us by another failing to do what they said, for everything, Lord, we ask now, Jesus, that your blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And I pray, Lord, that you would heal. I pray that you would restore. I pray that you would come in and give hope. I pray that you would come and give power. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to enter into people now as they open up their hearts, as they are thinking about failed relationships, about things that have gone wrong, about challenges. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, heal, restore, because of Jesus and his death on the cross. Thank you, thank you that you make a difference. Amen.